welcome to the pseudo show this is brandon no housekeeping today just gonna dive right into the podcast today i'm joined with my co-host neil Neil asked Nate Graham from the KDE Project to join us to have a conversation about Plasma as a platform, specifically around commercializing it. We talk about some ideas we have and just the general benefits of open source. Just, I think, a really good technology discussion. So thank you, Nate, for joining us for this episode. Now, without further ado, I give you commercializing with a K, KDE. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the Pseudo Show. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of cloud infrastructure so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building apps that grow your business. With predictable pricing and robust product documentation, get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful cloud computing. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the Touch Digital community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash touch2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Nate, thanks for coming on to The Pseudo Show podcast. I appreciate you making the time. And Neil, thanks for uh, coming back as uh, my uh, co-host. No, that's always, it's always uh, fun to have you on. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, me too. Happy to be here as well. This was kind of prompted ad hoc during a a quick planning session that Neil and Bill and I had last week. This is too interesting to pass up. Typically on the pseudo show, I don't like talking about desktop environments or anything like that. There's plenty of other outlets uh, to talk about those items. I, I mo- most usually when I bring someone on, there's some sort of business type context. When Neil was talking about the outcomes from Academy, I, I'm like, I got to talk, we got to talk to someone from KDE now. And so what, w- one of the big things that Neil is saying is that Plasma is no longer just the Plasma desktop. It's no longer just like Plasma mobile. It's, it's a, broader platform to build your applications, uh, for, whether that for KDE desk for the KDE plasma desktop or for now big screen for mobile and for, uh, we'll get into it later plasma Inc. Uh, what, what does that re- mean for the wider KDE community from your point of view? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, the way we have it set up is that KDE has always been a community that's really interested in flexibility. And Plasma as a desktop experience reflects that flexibility. It's made up of these individual components. You can swap them out. And one of the parts of that flexibility is that we've able to been able to extract the desktop-specific functionality from everything else. And it turns out the desktop-specific functionality is only a small fraction of what can be shared theoretically between other platforms. So you pointed out Plasma Mobile. Plasma Mobile is this sort of Plasma core with mobile-specific bits on top of it. Um, And that core is something that we call Plasma Nano. It's kind of the the core of a a, a whole environment. It could be a desktop environment. It could be a mobile environment. um, It could be any kind of environment. But it's formulated in such a way that it's flexible enough for you to build your own stuff on top of it, sort of a thin shell. and, And you can use Plasma Nano as the base GUI environment for pretty much anything, you know, desktop, mobile, coffee machine, anything you can think of. So 
When am I going to get plasma coffee? Plasma <laughs> coffee, man. That's the next big, big thing. I don't know. It might be too hot. Don't want to get sued. The The first thing I think of when I hear about this plasma nano thing and, and the ability to put it in whatever is like, well, plasma is super good at this multimedia stuff and providing an, a really high quality experience for, for those sorts of things. You know, I, why not a plasma car or anything like that? I, I think I remember a joke about plasma car uh, a couple <laughs> years back. So, you know, it seems like it's a good fit for building all kinds of custom experiences. We'd even have the perfect name for it. We could call it car with a K. Yeah. There you go. On that subject, we learned during Academy that the Ambition Company, which is a sort of subsidiary of Mercedes, is using KWIN in their cars. So, you know, perhaps car with a K is not as far off as, as you might imagine. So as a platform, now what what are what is KDE doing to attract new developers? Is it just from that flexibility standpoint, or is there like any kind of a stabilization, like whether if that's like, I don't, I don't want to say guarantee. I don't like using the word guarantee that makes it an attractive target to the, to write your, an application for. Well, we have a couple elements of this. Uh, when we talk about Plasma Nano, Plasma Nano is not actually an application framework. This is essentially a framework for building a whole GUI environment. Uh, we have our own platform for building apps. And uh, for especially next generation apps, we call that platform Kirigami, which is sort of the KDE equivalent to GNOME's Libedwaita, which they've had a lot of success with. And we've been doing this for quite some time. And using the Kirigami framework allows you to write apps that are sort of inherently convergent. You write it once and it needs only minimal tweaking to look well and perform well on, on a different form factor. And we've had a lot of success with this. Uh, a number of our apps have had their own GUI interfaces rewritten with Kirigami. We've succeeded in attracting a lot of new talent who's people who are interested in Plasma Mobile. Um, all Plasma Mobile apps are written in Kirigami. And so I would say in terms of what we're doing to attract developers, having a good platform really helps a lot. Using modern up-to-date technologies really helps a lot. This stuff uses the Cute Company's QML, which is really nice to work with. It's C++ and CMake, all really industry standard tools. So there's, there's a market for your skills if you learn skills in KDE and then move out into the wider marketplace. Um, and there's just a lot of excitement around it too. I'm, I'm personally a big believer in the power of motivating through excitement. And when a platform seems to be doing well and it's attracting people, I think that becomes kind of a self-reinforcing cycle where more people want to get involved and they say, wow, this thing is really cool. A lot of people are into it. I want to, I want to join in. I think at KDE, we benefit from this a lot. You've mentioned that this, that's based, that you're utilizing, uh, obviously QT. That's mm -hmm. the, the basis for this. And probably one of QT's, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll say it's superpowers for being essentially a C and C++ framework is its ability to be more or less cross-platform. Is there any initiatives to push more of the applications that are being written for Plasma or using the, uh, the KDE application frameworks mm -hmm. to be more cross-platform? And what, what, I, I, what I mean is even like Mac or Windows? So yes, uh, that's a good question. The answer is a very enthusiastic yes. We currently have over 100 apps. We have like 160 something applications. It's really a lot. And we have some of them available for other platforms in a fully supported way. Um, for example, on the Windows Store, you can currently get uh, you can get Ocular, our document reader. You can get Kate, our text editor. KWrite, a sort of lightweight version of it. Elisa, a music player. Um, G Compre, our kids learning app. Tons of stuff. There's less of an effort around macOS because it's sort of inherently diff more difficult, but there are some efforts there. And in recognition of the fact that putting our apps on more platforms is really important, we have, in fact, just hired a person to work professionally on broadening the reach of KDE apps by getting them on more app stores. Um, the KDE 
the KDE's nonprofit foundation called the KDE EV. It's like sort of the equivalent of the GNOME Foundation. Um, they hire several people to work on stuff. And one position that just opened, uh, was filled recently, is for an app stores engineer. So we actually have somebody working around the clock to expand this. Um, and so far, we've been pretty happy and successful with, with that effort. Yeah, c- continuing on that with the mobile application, Plasma Mobile, quite frankly, is probably not going to hit that mass market adoption. Is there any initiative to move to get Plasma mobile apps, at least, probably not on iOS. iOS is uh, difficult uh, for, if it's not a Swift app or Objective-C. What about getting them into Android? Yeah, so we've already gotten uh, a number of our Plasma mobile apps on Android. This is a subject I don't know an enormous amount about, but I know that we have done it. Um, I, I can't tell you right now whether they're on the um, on the Play Store or on a, a different one, but I know that a number of my colleagues do use KDE's mobile apps on their Android devices. So it's something that we we work on, something that we do. Um, uh, an app that I use and sometimes contribute to called NeoChat, which is a matrix client. I know that there's an Android version of that one, for example. Um, and that's kind of low hanging fruit because it would replace Element, which has some problems. Um, I think we're a lot of us look for replacements for Element from time to time. And NeoChat is very nice. So yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. All, All the, the time. T- Every time. I hate it, right? I, I, it, it's a slow but oh my gosh. Yeah. That's what you get for running a uh for a JavaScript. I just want less chromiums running on my computer. <laughs> yeah, that's really that, what I right? want. Less chromiums. <laughs> yeah, I have too many chromes. Way too many chromes. <laughs> I think many of us are in the same boat. So yeah, <laughs> when when I got involved with the NeoChat project, it was sort of a fledgling app, but the, the desire to switch away from Element was so high that I think a lot of people got involved very quickly. And it's a really great app now. It's It's got almost everything that you need that can fully replace Element. And it's it's rare that I open Element anymore. I got NeoChat open all the time instead. And that's, yeah, that's that's on Android. So, so check it out. I'm going to have to take a look at it. I only have, uh, my main phone's an iPhone right now, but I'll have to look at it on my other uh, device. Underneath the, pla- uh, I'm going to, try to stop calling it plasma desktop at some point because it really is the plasma platform well one of one things on top of that platform is the plasma desktop so you can you can say that if you're talking about the desktop talking about the desk but yeah but i mean specifically yeah plasma mobile built on plasma desktop i need to change (laughs) that specifically really there's the there's big screen Mobile, Ink. Is there any others that I might be missing? Maybe Car someday. <laughs> Maybe Car someday. Um, there's also a voice assistant made by a third-party company. Um, you might have heard of the Mycroft project. It's sort of an open source version of voice assistants. And at this point, the effort made there's the uh, commercial effort made by a company, and then there's a community fork of their work. And this stuff is building right on top of all this plasma stuff. It's just, it's basically KDE technology, right? Right. All the way down there. But actually, since, since you brought up Mycroft, you know, let's expand on that uh, from a, like, what's the bit it, from a community standpoint, what's been the um, big use case uh, that that covers? Like, is it just, Hey, open my app or is it been, actually running their smart house if uh, if they have that. I think it's more of the latter. At this point, I think most of us are not really in the habit of talking to our desktops and laptops. This is kind of an awkward interaction, but the Minecraft software runs on dedicated hardware. And when you when you put them together, you've basically got something that's a competitor to like a, an Amazon Alexa, for example. And all of these efforts are sort of in their infancy. You know, they're, they're community efforts, they're, they're early alpha efforts. But the idea is to create a fully free software, privacy respecting device that does all this stuff without sending your you know, voice identification to the NSA and those sorts of things. And and then on the commercial aspect, I mean, obviously there's going to be some sort of home device, but is there any other commercial aspects that that 
that you that you see materializing out of that, whether that's coming from the community or from uh, the company backing Mycroft? So at the moment, there's one commercial product that comes from the company. I would really like to see commercial efforts bubbling up from the community as well. Um, I'm not heavily involved in that community, so I don't know the details or any future plans. But I think given how complete the software stack is at this point, it's kind of a matter of anybody who wants to push into that direction just needs to go find a partner and, and do it. So with this Mycroft stuff in particular, what's been the most interesting aspect when it, uh, you know, from the relationships point of view, because like Plasma Big Screen builds on Mycroft for providing a voice interface for the the 10-foot UI. I imagine that there's been some interesting um, things going on uh, behind the scenes maybe for bringing Plasma Big Screen to more places or like making it in products or whatever? Has there been any anything of the sort around that? Because it seems like it has a ton of potential for, you know, for things like televisions and, and signage and stuff. So we actually had a discussion about this at Academy just a couple of weeks ago. We had a, a big birds of a feather discussion about future hardware plans. And one idea that repeatedly came up was, hey, maybe we should find somebody to partner with to put Plasma Big Screen on like a little tiny set-top box hardware. I don't know of any currently active developments in that area, but it's something that a lot of people are very interested in. I think what we have to do is start those conversations and look for partners, but it seems like that hardware and that software are kind of a match made in heaven. It's just something that has to, has to get started. Yeah, there's a lot of things to unpack Neil probably brought up Plasma Big Screen because he knows full of ideas on this now. <laughs> so my immediate knee-jerk reaction for Plasma Big Screen actually wasn't focused on TVs or like typical digital signage. I was actually thinking more like um, conference room displays. Mm. So something that can be customized to fit that you know like a the a boardroom display you know company logo something really makes everything look really pretty but the, the thing that would uh, i would need to be able to do is uh receive like a a mirror cast or um an airplay yeah um, uh right so something or google or chromecast yeah you know, that that's a different problem but that like that was my one of my immediate I'm like ah because just because of the customizability uh and um also, the frameworks available. I'm, I, I'm like that. That 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 would be a great use case because I was looking at a couple of conference uh, displays for my home office, just because mm. I wanted one. Yeah, I wanted one with like pen input and stuff like that. Uh, it's basically a virtual whiteboard. They're in hideously expensive. It, it's like a, a touch screen, an equivalent touch screen without the software is like maybe thousand dollars, but the uh, but now that I have add software, it's three. It's great. <laughs> so, I, this is like something I could see equalizing that market. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Um, that use case never even occurred to me. And I think your articulation of it is something that could be really valuable. So I would encourage you to maybe get in touch with somebody in KDE and, and pitch this. Uh, this this All right. sort of... This sort of goes to my general observation that in KDE, we're often very technology focused. We, we build really cool stuff, but sometimes we don't think quite as much about applications of it. And then other people come up with ways to use what we've built. And we're like, wow, that's really creative. I didn't think of that. Yeah. So I think it, it kind of leverages our, our strengths providing tools for other people to figure out how to use. We're slowly moving in the direction of, of becoming a little bit more opinionated about how we want to use our own tools. But yeah, the way other people choose to use the stuff that we've developed is kind of a cornerstone of, I think, what makes KDE appealing. I, I, I always come from it from this other angle, m mostly because I see the the market is just saturated with uh, TV sticks and uh, you know, from, you know, with like Fire TV. Uh, Android TV, Apple TV, Android TV already integrated into the display. There's uh, only a handful of uh, companies make you know doing that particular use case in that corporate that corporate use case. It's a great point, and then you could sell business to business and really rake in the big bucks. 
Yeah, that that's where the money is. <laughs> Not trying to sell like a twenty nine ninety nine stick to consumers. Anyway, that was my idea. So if anyone wants to pick that up, you know, go for it. Uh, I'd love to see that in uh, in plasma big screen. So All right, why don't I just write it <laughs> for, down? Free right idea. Now? Free idea, free idea. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the other thing that's come up is maybe digital signage. Like what? Like what's been uh, that work? What does that? What does that look like? Uh, I don't even know if if that particular use case has um, been fully investigated. This is a very new product that mm -hmm. we have. Yeah, yeah. Just Still, I just I'd come ask. out with really. Um, I think I digital I'd signage ask. is it's kind of. A, a very obvious extension of it. I, I think we should probably move in that direction if we haven't already. Uh, this is this is a, a project that I'll admit I haven't been super involved with. So um, I've been learning about a lot of the details of it at the same time that other people have. But I, I do know the people involved. And so I can definitely ask them about that because digital signage seems like, yeah, it's sort of a, a no-brainer. All I want to do is I just want to, you know, poke on my laptop and just click a button and have the video just swoosh to the to the TV so that I can watch it on the plasma big screen and then maybe you know be able to uh, you know interact with it via remote or touch or whatever to just swoosh things around on the on the interface when I want to feel particularly lazy or super cool it would That's be all so cool do. someday someday we'll <laughs> get there well, I can do most of that with my iPad on an Apple TV. So yeah. you just use an iPad and an Apple TV, Neil. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't no. going to say it, but you went there. That's you know, that's the benefit of the closed system, right? But I don't want to buy an Apple TV. Like, my Mac is pretty much my limit in terms of the Apple ecosystem. I bounced out of all the rest of it because it got to be too... Yeah. Yeah, like, that's the challenge, right? Like, all of this stuff works really great when you have everything from a single vendor. But the moment you say, oh, well, I'm going to replace my iPad with an Android tablet, boom, all of a sudden, then that doesn't work anymore. And you can't get iMessages on it. And it doesn't cast to your Apple TV, and so on and so forth. So it's like, the the ecosystem sort of pushes you in the direction of going there completely. Um, I think a lot of us have been there, I've been there myself. But ultimately, having more open platforms, I see it as a lower risk proposition, actually. Because when you get all your stuff from a single vendor, you're you're really tied to them. And if they make decisions you don't like, switching away from that or mitigating those decisions can be impossible or extremely expensive in terms of time, resources, and money. Um, and I've been there too and had to make those switches. And, you know, as great as an experience as it can be when you get everything from a single vendor, it's like it, it won't last forever. Yeah, that well, it's not impossible. It's just always really expensive. It's never, it, it's everything's possible. It just takes a lot to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. On Plasma Mobile. I, I have never used Plasma Mobile, even though I have a Pine phone somewhere in my office. Uh, I think I turned it on twice. I think it probably still has the default Mobian install. But <laughs> <laughs> obviously right now, the general target audience is technical users probably familiar with plasma right what's the push to try to get plasma mobile on on a device maybe not it doesn't it be on pine phone plasma mobile has actually been on devices last year or maybe it was two years ago there was a company called jing that came out with a tablet called the jing pad um and that was running plasma mobile that was commercial hardware that you could buy running the product. Now, the product didn't end up doing that well um, and was canceled, but I like to be optimistic and say that it wasn't our fault, but that was an example, right? And I think in a lot of ways, the tablet use case is a sort of an easier target because you don't have to deal with the whole telephony stack issue. Um, it's a little bit more of a self-contained computer. And especially if it's like an x86 tablet or something, you can run normal apps on it. Um, everything doesn't need to be so closely designed for a tiny mobile screen. But in general, there's a desire to bring Plasma Mobile to more embedded hardware. Right now we've got um, we've got Pine and, and they've shipped the Pine Phone and the Pine Phone Pro with Plasma Mobile for several years now. 
this is, it's sort of in proof of concept stage, I guess you could say, you know, nobody's going to go out and buy this thing and use it as their daily driver every day. But the fact that you can do it at all and make calls on it and develop on it and use it as a proof of concept, I think is a really important step considering how expensive all this stuff is in, in the commercial world. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars, right? Like companies that want to make a new mobile phone, it costs them unimaginable sums of money to do. And so, sure, we're not able to be competitive with that right now. Um, but I think it helps to try, right? I think you can't win if you don't show up. And so showing up is really important because that means you've got a shot and you can build energy and enthusiasm around it and you can attract developers around it. And when you have that, that effort, even if ultimately it ends up failing, that effort can benefit other things too. Like when I talked about our Kirigami application framework, for example, all these Plasma mobile apps use that framework but it isn't just used for mobile apps. So any Plasma mobile developers who find an issue in it or who uh, make a new feature in it or enhance the user interface, those benefits affect desktop apps that are using that framework too. So we get these synergies when, when people are, are using this so that their efforts don't have to be confined to just exactly the one tiny little product that they're using, that they're developing on. Speaking of showing up, uh, what one of my I always whenever I think about showing up in the, in uh, these uh, spaces that have been very saturated in in terms of like the commercial market, I mm -hmm. always go back to. I feel like I go back to my comfort zone of B two B, but th this really does apply to both Plasma Desktop and Plasma Mobile. Uh, if you can't answer this question, that's fine. This is a this is a load. I think this is a loaded question. One of the things that I know larger corporations look for is mobile device management, mobile device security, that that type of thing. So being able to issue a user a device, like whether that's a laptop or a phone, and being able to push the corporate apps to it, being able to remote wipe it things you know that the that remote wipes are a complicated thing but specifically let's go you know let's to keep it simple and just do the corporate applications corporate vpn push to the device from a plasma mobile perspective or plasma desktop perspective are there hooks or drivers to make it easier to manage plasma from the, uh, that perspective like uh, at scale like I'm talking, I'm not talking like, oh, I have 10 laptops on my desk. I'm talking, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hundreds of computers. Right. 10,000 computers. Yeah. So this is a subject I don't know a huge amount about. I'll do my best to answer it. Um, my impression right now is that this is a space we haven't been extensively competitive in in the past. Um, I think we have done, we do have evidence of large deployments of Plasma Desktop at scale. To be perfectly honest, I don't know what kind of management solution they're using because Plasma has its own. It has something called kiosk mode. There's administrator mode. Uh, so we do have the ability to lock down certain things. Um, you can do remote changes, but... I genuinely don't have data on whether that's being used or whether the people deploying our stuff are using custom stuff. Some of this comes because we don't really collect data on this sort of thing. Like we have a telemetry system, but it's very new and the day it's opt-in. Um, some distros even patch it out entirely and the data that we collect is extremely limited and benign. So I, I can't tell you whether they're using what we've got. We'd like to know. I, I think I'll agree with your basic premise, which is that to be more competitive, especially in the corporate world, these are tools that are really important to have, that you need to facilitate sysadmins being able to remotely manage a fleet of machines. A few years ago, when KDE was voting on which goals we wanted to pursue for the next couple of years, I guess maybe I should describe this process. So um, within KDE, we have we have a, a multi-year process whereby uh, we have these goals that get voted on in the community. So you, anybody can propose a goal and then people vote on them. And then whichever three win get sort of a certain amount of focus for the next couple of years. And a few years ago, one proposed goal was KDE for big enterprise. 
I voted for it. I was so excited about that. Unfortunately, it didn't end up winning. But there was a whole list of things that we can do that we know is really important for for enterprise scale stuff that we haven't historically put an enormous amount of effort into. For the last many years, since I've been involved in uh, KDE development, I think we've been kind of focusing on the basics, getting the basics right first. Uh, we had a lot of bad reputations to overcome from from history. Things like, oh, it's bloated, it's slow, it's ugly, it's buggy, it's crashy, all those things, right? You know, everybody's familiar with these things. And we've been really hammering on this stuff for the last couple of years. And I think we've we've mostly gotten there. And so when I look in my crystal ball, I think we have in many ways freed up the resources to work on more specialized, impactful things, things like big corporate stuff, things like detailed accessibility, things like automated fuzzing and testing of our user interfaces, all sorts of stuff that we frankly just didn't have the ability to do before, and now we can. So I, I think we can maybe do those things going forward. I want to chime in here a little bit about this, because this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. In my experience with, with Plasma, it is not exactly easy to do the kind of configuration for this in a centrally managed way. So like, yes, Plasma has a whole mechanism for configuring all this stuff, but it's also very difficult to say this thing needs to go and uh, to get this configuration, it reaches out to something to, to get those settings or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of dovetailing a little bit into probably one of the most exciting commercial ventures for KDE, the Steam Deck, right? Uh, I can easily foresee like a large assortment of decks being purchased and used in environments for things like what's it vocational schools that teach game development and game design and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and in those environments, they're going to want to have those decks centrally managed and locked down. Um, not necessarily because, you know, they need to, you know, uh, constrain the user or anything for a nefarious purpose, but like they need to make sure the bloody thing works the same way all the time. So that like their, their pictures and their guides and stuff, sure, actually match yeah. what, the, what the deck actually has on there. Yeah. Stuff like that. I agree with you completely. Um, this isn't a, a major area of, of my expertise, but I know that there's a lot of knowledge in the community that this is something we've historically been weak in that we need to move into if we want to, have more success in those spaces. Um, at the moment, I think there's a lot of third-party solutions that sort of wrap whatever your configuration management happens to be. And I've, I've used some of these professionally in previous jobs and in, in a previous career as a build engineer and sysadmin, I've used some of them. Um, but I will totally agree with you that we need to we need to have a better story in, in Plasma and in KDE software in general here. So an interesting tidbit, the kind of centralized settings system in Daemon that they have in GNOME is something that we implicitly support as well. Uh, we in KDE, this is sort of our mantra is let's build a plugin system around it. So our config system right now mostly uses INI files, but it could use a database for the back end. It has that ability. We just mostly don't use it. What? What? Hold up. What? Yeah, so our kconfig framework for all this, it's got all those pieces there. It's just not used. So it's similar, actually not similar, the same as GNOME can be, config can be stored in a like dconf. It's not exactly the same, but it's sort of the same principle, you know, a central registry type system. And right now we don't use it. We, we have our stuff stored in files on disk, but that's simply one plugin for it. And there are plugins for other things. I mean, they're probably unmaintained at this point. They've they've been sitting in the code base for a very long time, but in principle, it can do that. And so somebody who wanted to revitalize it probably could. I, I vaguely remember seeing this uh, when I was using, this is back in the day. This is KDE 3.5. So again, I... I, I think I date myself more every single time I record an episode <laughs> and talk. <laughs> I, I kind of vaguely remember some of that back then. Like, I, I think it goes that far back, but I, the whole use. Yeah. The, one of the things that Neil and I have talked about, like, Oh, if we're going to man, man, if it was for managing KDE plasma at scale, what, what does that look like? 
is it ansible is a puppet you know what, what what is it really uh to manage those that type of config well i can't tell you that this stuff all works but i know that there's code for it i think this is one of those things that would make sense to advertise more because speaking from a part of my background that i don't like talking too much about in 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 the world of being a mass systems administrator specifically with windows the it is very common for uh mass systems management providers to basically provide an architecture to hook right into the registry and other mechanisms inside of windows for self-configuration to provide their own means of translating those that's those settings right so like providing you know a documentation and primitives and exposing that particular capability could be an opportunity itself for improving you know commercialization opportunities because like i didn't know that kde plasma had this capability and that is a very attractive feature for enterprise scale yeah. Linux desktop stuff. Well, technically it's not even plasma. It's actually deeper. It's in the whole configuration framework itself, which is used by all sorts of things. But the point stands, right? Like mm -hmm. it's one of those like neat little nuggets that, you know, I didn't know about Brandon didn't know about until you just told us right now. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I vaguely remember it, but that doesn't mean it really was there. I could be thinking of something completely different <laughs> or my brain is making it up. <laughs> I didn't even know about it myself until I was told about it by somebody who's been involved in KDE for, you know, 20 plus years. And I thought, wow, that's cool. I wonder why we don't use that anymore. So it's it's sort of an interesting, yet another example, I think, of where KDE being a very technology-focused community, we we often build the future before anybody else has it or knows it. But then we often fail to properly commercialize it or, or apply it or take advantage of it. And then it kind of stagnates. Then other people do it. And we say, wait a minute, we have the technology for this. We could do that too. And then we go back and we do that. Like another example is recently the GNOME people, like a year or two ago, they had, they got the ability to, to um, have like color changing wallpapers based on day and nighttime and like the color scheme. And we took a look at this and we said, wait a minute, we have all the plumbing to do this. We could just we could just do this like tomorrow. And then we did because we had the technology. It was there. We just hadn't applied it in that way that was like sort of useful. And so, you know, one thing that I often bang on a little bit inside KDE is like it's not enough that we have the best tech. We have to apply it in ways that are actually useful for real people's use cases. Like that's that's ultimately what matters. You know, and if you do this with the best tech, great, you win, right? But like, what matters is that final step, getting over the finish line to like make it useful to real people. So when I was using KDE back in the day, it's these days I, I've been I'm using Fedora Workstation, so I'm using GNOME. One of the things I loved about it was that it was so yeah, you know, and I still love about it is it's so configurable, and there's so many things underneath the covers that are. Some of it's documented, some of it's not, but that's also its Achilles heel. Yeah, I, I, I get my desktop just the way I love it, and then I have to take it somewhere else, and it is, you know, and I'm like, wait, there, it doesn't quite work, or, or a feature that again, you know, it's like hasn't been touched in years, but I loved it. <laughs> so, but it got taken out of the code base. Oh, where did it go? But. <laughs> Yeah, this, this flexibility is sort of our strength and our weakness at the same time, because as you've said, right, sometimes things are impossible to maintain. It's really difficult to document all of this. When you have lots of things that are interacting with each other, it creates the ability to kind of break the system. And so I think what I try to do in my development work on Plasma is try to embody our motto, which is simple by default, powerful when needed. And so the idea here essentially is that despite all this configurability and flexibility, you shouldn't have to use it to have a good out-of-the-box experience. And, and maybe you're a person with very specific needs and you want to use it. And that's great. And we fully support that. And we don't ask you to like go and get a bunch of breakable plugins for that. It's fully first-party supported, but you shouldn't have to to have a good experience. And, and so this has been a major focus of the Plasma team for the last couple of years is we know that we're really good about the powerful when needed, but we've been hammering very hard on the simple by default part as well. So that when you, when you start using the system, it doesn't feel so much like a space shuttle. 
I, I I've noticed that every single time I load up Fedora KDE, I've noticed that it's definitely getting simpler. It, it's not it's not as simple as uh, GNOME is out of the box. Um, granted, I have to tweak yeah. it to beyond belief to get <laughs> it to be powerful, but that's a different story. <laughs> Yeah, I think each one of our communities has our sort of historical strengths and our historical weaknesses there, right? I Probably all three of us would consider ourselves power users, right? I tried using GNOME for a while myself, and I actually really enjoyed it. I, In general, I think they're, what they have is excellent, but I ran into problems when I tried to tweak it to meet my needs. I found that it broke a lot. And the more customization I did, the more frequently it broke. And in the end... I wound up with KDE for a number of reasons, but one reason was because it was more robust in the face of what I wanted to turn it into. And I, I think that's sort of one of our strengths is that we're, we're really good about letting you make it what you want. We haven't historically been so good at offering like a well-curated out-of-the-box experience, but it's an area of focus. You know, we work on it. We're we're really trying to make it that. Yeah, I would, I'd say that like the the big advantage for the KDE platform. And actually a big reason why I would see um, companies and enterprises in general wanting to invest in KDE technologies is precisely because of that, right? Like you've got all the tools, you've got all the pieces, the frameworks, the modules, the cross-platform capability, the portability, uh, and, and really the flexibility to just do whatever you want with it um, with a really kind community that actually accepts and helps people be successful doing that sort of thing. Like it's a very rare, it's a very rare thing in this space to have a community that's both technically very strong and willing to work with other people's point of views and needs and desires and, and, and requirements and, and help work together to build a better future. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Neil. Uh, I actually gave a talk at Academy that touched on on this subject quite quite closely because what we're actually seeing over the last couple of years is that a lot of companies are choosing to ship some kind of plasma on their device. But I say some kind of plasma very deliberately because often it's not exactly plasma desktop, right? Like it's it's something for SteamOS or it's something for Mycroft or it's like very heavily customized and tweaked. And I think I think an advantage for our platform that does make it attractive is exactly what you said, is that if you have a piece of hardware that is not like a bog standard desktop, you can ship Plasma on it however you want. And moreover, when you when you try to do that, we don't fight you, right? And if you go to the Plasma developers and you say, hey... I've got this idea for something that I want to do, but I can't figure out how to do it, or there's something that's wrong. We don't tell you, no, you're doing it wrong. That That's not our vision for Plasma. You can't do that. We say, huh, that's interesting. Let's see if we can help you figure out how to make it meet your needs. You know, we're, we're very open to allowing people to customize it and make it something that makes sense for, for their platform. You know, this, this happens on the individual level. And it's also at the at the commercial level, right? Like if people want a weird device with plasma on it, that's great. We'll we'll help them make it happen. We're not going to say no. That that doesn't meet our vision for what plasma is. With the, a lot of the stuff we've talked about uh, that I kind of I brought up or and that we've we've all discussed has benefits outside of the the core use case that conference room television, you know, conference room display, being able to, you know, uh, use a uh, mirror cast or airplay or Chromecast to that, that benefits of it. That, that doesn't just benefit that use case. It benefits a home user. Exactly. It, it, yeah. It, and, uh, so it, it's build it for the context, but yeah, other people are going to benefit, uh, like, like actually a great example, like, uh, a lot of the, uh, technologies uh, a lot of the kernel changes that were made for android greatly impacted uh the linux desktop and linux on server mm -hmm. so like for example like the power saving modes yeah uh, like that greatly increased battery life on laptops for for people that are running linux and it also decreased uh decreased power consumption in the data center so there's 
there's be- unseen benefits. Yeah, you may not see the benefit when someone's describing the use case, but there are other benefits uh, if you're able to, if you can think about it beyond yeah. the use case. One I can specifically think of uh, that's relevant to big screen is, so big screen wanted the ability to extract the average color of, of an, an image to use it as sort of the background for like a card for that image. So uh, we added this feature into Kirigami to allow you to extract the uh, the average color from an image. And we found that it was really useful later when we wanted to add a feature to allow you to set the accent color on your system from your wallpaper. So all we had to do was reuse that function and say, hey, find the average color of this wallpaper. Boom, now that's the accent color. Then we discovered that that function worked okay, but it could be improved. And so we changed it so that it uses a much more sophisticated algorithm. And now that change benefits big screen as well because its colors look better. So it's like these these changes really uh, uh, are broadly useful beyond the original application that they were designed for. I think that actually exemplifies the best part of open source, right? You build something for one use case or one user and you share it with others and you get unexpected benefits all over the place. Yeah, exactly. And then sometimes other people, when they're using your code for something that you didn't expect, they find a way to make your code even better in a way that benefits them and then you benefit from it too, which is what happened here. Yeah, I, you know, overall with this with this conversation, what I feel how, that we can take away from this, or at least I can take away from this, is that the KD community has reached a level of maturity with their solutions that they have develop and offer that they're they're basically ready to take that step of bringing it to the world or having the world bring it to them and i think with the recent successes with the steam deck and um some of the mobile ventures that have gone on like um with pine 64 it i think it clearly shows that there's a a real track record for success in in growing the visibility of KDE technologies. And so what I hope to see, you know, going forward is maybe a little bit more emphasis and 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 I don't know, chest thumping, I don't know what phrase to use here of like the 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 successes, commercial successes that we see like we did at Academy like you you gave a a, a talk and there was a couple of other talks where, where it was pretty much emphasizing the commercial success of KDE, which really, I think, helps put nails into that coffin of the idea that KDE can't be used in a commercial context or an enterprise context. And I think that's that's really important. Yeah, it's, it's a subject that's really very near and dear to my heart because I, I believe very firmly that the way to reach people is by selling devices to them, that that's a thousand times more impactful than offering an ISO on a website and saying, okay, well here, go download it and delete the OS that comes on this, this piece of hardware. You know, we can do that. Right. But how many people can do that? Not a lot of people can do that. Um, and so the productization of KDE software is something that we're all very interested in at the moment. Um, I think to get back for a moment to what you talked about earlier with like the enterprise configuration management, even if KDE software isn't perfectly suited out of the box, one thing I really want to emphasize is that we're open to changing it. Um, When somebody comes to us and they say, hey, we have this use case, we want to work with them to make that use case work. And if that means some extra developer effort, that means extra developer effort. If they want to sponsor somebody to work on it, we're going to work with them and probably accept that code. One thing I would really like to see going forward is more outside investment in KDE. I think oftentimes it's easy to say, okay, well, this stuff isn't literally perfect already. We're not going to use it. But, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I think if, if a company wants to put KDE software on their hardware, it's amazing if it perfectly works out of the box, but it's also really nice if we can get a little bit of outside development help with that because we can't anticipate every use case. And sometimes, you know, it's it's important that some tweaks and customizations happen to make sure that it, it works well on that hardware. Um, and so we've seen 
uh, a lot of support from hardware vendors and we've seen financial patronage from them. And this is this is really great. Uh, one thing I'd like to encourage is, you know, hire hire your own internal devs to work on KDE software. That would be amazing. I think any company that does this, any company that's currently selling uh, devices with KDE code on it, if they hired internally people to to work on it, who would then contribute upstream, that would make such an enormous positive difference for KDE as a whole. It would be really wonderful. And I know not not just uh, development work, but donations are probably going to be needed as well. I've recorded a some commentary on this a couple episodes back specifically uh, I was specifically talking about enterprise use case cases but I do believe that individuals enterprises anyone that has, gains value from software they should spe- especially if it's open source free software should donate to the developer if they can afford it yeah so a major change in KDE that's relatively recent is that there's now interest in hiring professional developers within KDE itself. Uh, there's a relatively rich ecosystem of third-party companies around KDE that pay people to work on KDE software. Uh, I myself am actually employed by one such company, Blue Systems, and many other people are employed by that company and others like KDAB, like Inyoka, like a bunch of other ones. Um, but one thing that we're we're doing recently is trying to help the actual KDE community itself do some hiring internally. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have this App Store position that has is has currently been filled. Actually, we hired a, a member of the KDE community, which is really wonderful. Um, but the willingness and interest is now there to do this, and in order to make it happen, the KDE EV needs a lot more money to make it happen because. Historically, the budget hasn't needed to be very high uh, because we didn't have huge salary expenses, but that's going to be changing. And so I think what you're saying about if you get value from this software, consider donating to support it is a really important conversation to have because this stuff isn't free. You know, a, a lot of people who work on KDE software are volunteers, but many are not. Many are paid and they're not currently paid by KDE, but they're paid by others who are deriving value from it. And so I think it's sort of that thing where if you are getting value from it, yeah, you know, maybe we're not going to make you, right? But please consider donating. Donating is really important to ensure the future sustainability of the software because volunteers can't do everything. Like volunteers tend to work on things that are exciting, that are you know, that are sexy, that are interesting to them, that that benefit their personal use cases. But I, I feel fairly strongly that it takes professional paid engineers to work on the really hard nitty gritty stuff that is not fun, um, like hashing out new Wayland protocols, for example, which is extremely technical and political and involves a lot of patience. And, you know, who wants to do that on a volunteer basis? Not a lot of people. So you need pros to handle that sort of thing. And I think there are other parts of the stack where it's similar. So in KDE, we're very interested in hiring more people, but we pretty much can't do it without a big increase in fundraising. And so that's a a new focus of mine is working on that. So if there's anybody out there who's deriving value from KDE software, who likes it and who thinks that it would be good if we hired more professional developers, I would very strongly encourage you to donate to the KDE EV. Well, while we were sitting here uh, talking about that, I just donated 100 euro to the KDE Foundation. You rock. Thank you so much. And I encourage everyone to please donate to the KDE project so we can see more awesome work from this fabulous community. That is fantastic. Is there a way to do recurring donations? Yes, there is. Uh, It's not as obvious as it should be, and this is something I want to change. So if you go to the donation page, slightly below the giant banner on top, there is a way to become a supporting member where whereupon you'll make a recurring donation of 100 euros a year. Um, It's not customizable right now, really should be. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit we can pluck when it comes to our, um, the user interface of our donation system. Uh, So this is a potentially stupid 
question. I, KDEV, if I understand, that's a German entity. That's correct. Um, is is there a way for is there an American entity for uh, Americans to donate or entities for like otherwise non Europeans to be able to donate through to leverage the benefits of donating to a nonprofit? I know it's so, a little bit in the weeds, but like so it's a complicated. It is question. a thing. Um, it's a question I was actually looking into myself just yesterday. The answer is it's complicated. <laughs> okay, actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'll be more honest. The real answer is no. If you are an American person right now, there's currently no U.S. 5013C organization you can donate to to make your deduction tax deductible and to make your employer match it. That We don't have that right now. Um, I was looking into just yesterday what it would take to do this, and it, it would be quite a challenge um, because the, the exact thing that we would, we would want to do, which is essentially make it a pass-through for the German one, is something that the IRS does not want us to do. And so trying to do it anyway is a really bad idea because then bad things will happen. And so in order to make this work, we would essentially need for the U.S. To foundation to be independent of the German one and have its own financial decision-making and have its own leadership, have its own bylaws have its own directors, have its own articles of incorporation, so on and so forth. Um, and all this is possible, right? But that's a lot of work. And we would need enough Americans who are interested in, in doing this to maintain it. Because again, if we did this, it couldn't be a simple pass through where, you know, American person donates deduction, uh, they get the tax deduction, and then the American entity immediately sends it to Europe. Like that's, that's not allowed. So we, it would need to actually be a real organization that has a decision-making body and exercises fiduciary care over the funds. So if there's interest in doing that from enough Americans, I think we can do it, but it's kind of predicated on that. In this sense, the GNOME Foundation has it easier being an American one in the first place, at least easier for Americans, right? Not easier if you're German. It's easier to donate to the KDEV if you're German. It's, it's something that we need for there to be substantial interest from the community before we can do it. But there's a call to action. Yep. Any of you out there who are interested in nitty gritty legal and financial things? <laughs> Anybody? Hello? Crickets? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't so think so This is so the either. challenge in open source, right? Like all of us are here because we like cool tech stuff. And sometimes the, the set of interests don't overlap so much. Yeah. And it's a challenge. Like I, I've dealt with some of this kind of stuff in other project contexts and it's it's really not easy to deal with like it's possible right there's no reason there's no real blocker that says that we can't do it it would just require well a lot of work and a lot of people would need to put in that work um and those would need to be people who are actually interested in, and passionate in it and we see that most people in free software are passionate about free software and not the legal structure of nonprofit entities. It almost makes me wish I would have done just because I these days I have a passion to to not write code anymore, but to focus on the business side now of of open source. I wish I would have done what I wanted to do when I was in college, and that was become a lawyer to do all those things for open source communities. But I did not get. I did not do that. Honestly, it's something open source communities <laughs> desperately need is people with yeah, knowledge about how they work and also legal knowledge. It's it's a hole that needs filling. Oh, I don't know. I'm still young enough. I guess I can still do it. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, go get your JD. No big deal. That concludes this episode of The Pseudo Show. Head on over to YouTube slash Pseudo Show and make sure to get subscribed and hit that notification button to make sure you don't miss any content from the Pseudo Show podcast or Pseudo Show Labs. And head on over to tuxdigital.com for ways to engage in the conversation, whether that's on the forum or on the Discord channel. Thanks again for listening to the Pseudo Show podcast, where business meets open source.